Hello, I'm Marla Shapiro, and I sit on the board of the International Menopause Society. And today I'm joined by Nick Panay. Nick, welcome, and please introduce yourself to our healthcare practitioners. Thank you very much, Marla. Uh, my name is Nick Panay. I'm president-elect of the International Menopause Society, uh, and I'm a gynecologist from London. So today we're gonna to be talking about premature ovarian failure um, or premature ovarian insufficiency. So first define it because many people get confused in terms of what's early menopause and what actually qualifies for a diagnosis of prematurity. So premature ovarian insufficiency or premature menopause occurs when women run out of oocytes before the age of 40 years, leading to low estrogen levels and high FSH levels. It's also referred to as primary ovarian insufficiency. It occurs in about 3% of women, according to recent global demographic data. So if we look at younger women, let's say in their late 30s or early 40s, who begin to have um, irregular menstrual cycles, often these go unnoticed or not investigated. Should we be investigating them? Absolutely. Uh, I think this is one of the reasons there is such delayed diagnosis and then prompt institution of treatment. So irregular periods before the age of 40 particularly should be investigated promptly. This will facilitate timely diagnosis of premature ovarian insufficiency, and it will prevent unnecessary suffering and also minimize the risk of chronic medical conditions such as osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, and dementia. So what should we be looking for to make the diagnosis of POI? What type of test should we be doing? So reliable diagnosis of POI requires at least two elevated FSH levels, four to six weeks apart. We should not be making the diagnosis based on one blood test. Antimalarian hormone levels, uh, so antimalarian hormone is produced by the antral and preantral ovarian follicles, can be checked when there is diagnostic uncertainty, but are not mandatory. So when we think about premature ovarian insufficiency, often we'll think about the typical vasomotor symptoms of hot flashes or night sweats. What other distressing symptoms might we be asking about and might women be experiencing? Well, they may be experiencing mood swings, aches and pains, insomnia, but I think one of the uh, issues where you know, there is a real um, confusion, if you like, is when women present with psychological and psychosexual symptoms and perhaps those symptoms are not directly linked to the problems with the menstrual cycle. So we have to be mindful that this condition can affect uh, a number of systems uh, because of the catastrophic effect the loss of estrogen can have. So before we go on to these women who may end up with premature and total ovarian insufficiency, what about fertility issues in these women? So I think infertility is one of the most disturbing aspects of premature ovarian insufficiency. And there are no proven treatments to increase the, the, uh, the rates of pregnancy with autologous suicides. There is approximately a 5% chance of spontaneous pregnancy still occurring, but suicide donation is the best chance of pregnancy. Um, and I'm often asked, you know, is it possible to cryopreserve suicides? But by the time the diagnosis is made, usually that isn't feasible. Yes, often women are at least in their mid or late 30s before they think about this. And often we think about if you don't preserve in and around 30, that may just be too late. Well, we know that uh, fertility starts to drop off, drop off particularly mid 30s onwards um, because of the decline in, in suicides. And uh, uh, it's so important that we get the public health messages across that women should think about their fertility and family planning issues uh, whilst there's still some uh, time to do something about it. Now, let's talk about treatment of these women. Often, these women don't get menopausal hormone therapy because of headline news that they're concerned about and extrapolating studies in menopausal women to them. What messaging must we give healthcare practitioners about the importance of treating these women and how to treat these women? I think the key message is that hormone replacement is literally just replacing hormones which would normally have been present. And this should continue at least until the average age of the menopause, which is 51. We are essentially replacing hormones that are, would have been present anyway, and therefore the risk of breast cancer uh, and other long-term conditions is no different to that in women whose ovaries would have been working normally. It's essential that these women get adequate hormone replacement, 
not just from the point of view of quality of life, but also preserving their bone density, their cardiovascular health, and avoiding long-term conditions such as dementia and Alzheimer's. And I think that message is so important to get through to healthcare practitioners that we cannot extrapolate studies done in women of average age of menopause or in menopause to these younger women. Absolutely not. And this is an area that I feel very strongly about. We need to have better data for women of this uh, age group. Uh, we can collate these sort of data using a, a registry, which is uh, something that we launched a few years ago. Uh, but I also think we need long-term perspective randomized trials. And in fact, we are indeed planning such a trial uh, in the UK to follow women for a long period of time to look at uh, their quality of life, but also risk factors pertaining to bone, cardiovascular, and other issues. So I think that in terms of future directions of research, this is something that we should be prioritizing. Absolutely. There is a real dearth of data, good quality data in this area. Uh, we have guidelines, but the guidelines are only as good as the information that we put into them. So it's really important that we achieve uh, greater research, not only into hormonal options, but also into ways of potentially reversing the, the loss of oocytes. And there's some excellent work going on at the moment, looking at studies uh, with uh, oogonial stem cells uh, and stimulating primordial follicles. But uh, these data are in their infancy and we need better research. I think one of the most important messages I've heard you say in this interview for healthcare practitioners is the importance about asking about the menstrual cycles for women in their 30s and 40s and not just to assume that everything is status quo or the way it should be. Absolutely. Often uh, the irregularity of menstrual cycles is put down to stress or weight changes or conditions such as polycystic ovarian syndrome. But unless we take a careful history and look at the hormone levels and encourage women to come forward to report these issues, then we'll be missing diagnoses. And I worry that uh, the low incidence that we know of, of POI, is actually a much greater problem. And it's just that we don't detect it early enough. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and getting this important messaging across to our healthcare practitioners. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much, Marla.